Thank you all for being here. It is November 9th, 2023, and this is a special meeting of the Long-Term Financial Policy Audit Subcommittee. We will now call it to order and seeing a quorum. Madam Host, may you please call the roll. Chair Rogers. Present. Member Staff. Here. Member McDonald. Here. Let the order reflect that all subcommittee members are present. Thank you. Uh, and may you please uh, explain how public comment will be heard at today's meeting. Thank you, Chair Rogers. Welcome to the subcommittee members and members of the public. Thank you for joining us today in person and by Zoom. As a reminder to all present, please set your cell phone so as not to disturb others. Our meeting format is integrated with the members of the public watching via Zoom. Members of the public who are using Zoom may view and listen to the meeting and the meeting is being recorded. The City of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment, free from disruption, and will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully, or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. After an agenda item has been presented, the Chair will ask the subcommittee members for their comments or questions, and then immediately following their discussion, the Chair will open the item for public comment. If you are attending in person and wish to comment, you will be called on when the agenda item is open for public comment. Please raise your hand to indicate that you would like to comment. You will be asked if you wish to state your name for the record. Each public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Any email comments that were received by the deadline will have been included and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received are not read into the record. All right, seeing no one here from the public, we will move on to item three, which is approval of the minutes. We have one set of minutes for a special meeting um, on October 19, 2023, and I am looking to the committee to see if there are any changes that need to be made. Um, seeing none, we will approve them as presented and we still have no one in uh, present to provide public comment. So we'll continue on to item 4.1, which is CalPERS unfunded liability. Good evening, Chair Rogers, members of the committee. My name is Scott Wagner. I'm the Deputy Director of Finance. I'm very pleased to bring this item today uh, for CalPERS unfunded accrued liability update. Um, I want to start off my presentation by saying that CalPERS and pension is such a broad technical item. And my goal with this presentation, as we've kind of discussed before, was to really to provide some building blocks around pension knowledge to start at the bottom a little bit and start with some basics and then cover some history of the, of the system and kind of what's happened in the recent past here over the past decade and a half, along with where we are today and then where I think we're going and where we know we're going, along with some city actions and where uh, strategies that we've implemented to help. Next slide, please. So, um, like I said, this is what we'll be covering today. We're going to talk about the Section 115 trust towards the end, and what we're really hoping to get back from the committee is some feedback regarding our prior strategy. Alan and I have brought this item to the subcommittee each year since it's implemented it. It's our intention to continue to bring a pension item back to the subcommittee. Um, I would share that every department in the city could come forward and say what their most pressing issue at the city is. I think for finance, the way that we look at the city, it's pension. And I think the reason for that is that it impacts every single operation the city does. It impacts us in every way, given the size and the scale of the problem. Um, next slide, please. So let's, let's talk about some of the building blocks of how pensions work and just the basics of our pension plans. So pensions really get paid for by three different sources. It gets paid for by the employees. Out of every single employee's paycheck, they're gonna pay a little bit of their, of their pay, a percentage of their pay towards paying towards their pension. The city is gonna pay a percentage of the employee's salary towards their pension as well. They're gonna send that over to CalPERS, our contracting agency to help pay for their pension. The third major way that a pension is paid for is through investment earnings. And we're gonna see later in another slide that that is a major way that pensions are paid for. It's over half of a pension dollar going to a beneficiary is paid through by the investments of CalPERS. The main components of a pension plan when I think about it really are the benefit formula. When I think benefit formula is really how generous the benefit is for your employee. 
you frequently hear that termed as 3% at 60, two and a half at 55. It's shorthand for a public employee that, that kind of doesn't make sense right at first, but we're going to talk about the specifics and what really that formula means and how it impacts the city and how it impacts an employee. The actuarial assumptions. So when the actuaries get together and they try to figure out how much a pension could cost, they're going to think of a lot of different factors. They're going to think of when an employee enters the system and when they leave. That's a really fancy way for saying when do they retire and when do they die. Um, they, they're going to talk about when they think an employee, how long, many service years they're going to have, what's their final compensation going, going to look like. So they come up with a bunch of assumptions to think about how much that employee is going to cost throughout their career. And when that changes, it makes a big impact. The other third major building block when it comes to pension is what, what I'll call the expected rate of return. That also gets called discount rate. Those are slightly different, but really the same thing. It's how much we think CalPERS, or how much CalPERS thinks they're gonna earn on the money we give them, okay? The big thing to understand is that when any of those three things I just talked about change, it impacts the city greatly. When CalPERS changes how much they think they're gonna make, it's a very large impact to us. If they change how long people think are going to remain in the system, it changes things a lot for us. When we change a benefit formula, all these things have major effects, but it's really important for us to understand that when they make these changes, they're one of two things. They're forward-facing or they're rear-facing, and that makes a really big difference we're going to talk a lot more about in a minute. Next slide. So let's talk about benefit formulas. This is that 3% at 50 3% at 60 kind of, kind of thing. So it really is, is a way of looking at the years of service that employees put in, the age of when they retire, and their final compensation. So the city it has three different tiers of formula for our employees. And that's really based on and two set, different sets of employees. There are sworn public safety members and then our miscellaneous members. And that's a function of the employee's retirement benefit formula is based on their date of hire. So in the state of California, it is protected legally that when an employee is hired, it is essentially a contract for them of what their retirement formula is. You cannot go back later and change what an employee's, benefit, what an employee's retirement benefit is because essentially if you've agreed to it at the point that you've hired them, they have agreed to that as well. That's called the California rule. There's 12 other states that follow California in that guidance and point to us directly and say that that's the way it, it is and should be done. Um, what I have here on the board, it, it shows the counts amongst those formulas within the city. And I think this is really important in that these counts are changing every single year and they're changing in one direction. You can see in miscellaneous that over half of our employees now are what we call PEPRA. That is the lowest formula rate. That is the 2% at 60. They're at the very bottom, 426 employees. And every year the old, the classic employees or the more senior employees kind of fall off and we get a better, a more proportionate uh, members of new employees. So really the employees with the more generous pension plan are essentially phasing out of current employment. Um, the same could be said for public safety. They're not quite at half. Um, that change may kind of happen all at once as folks phase out. More miscellaneous is more of a gradual change. Next slide. So a couple of different, let's talk about the left side of this slide first. And um, what I wanted to show here is what the average retiree within our plans, what is their benefit really like? And I think this is valuable to look at because I think there's a misconception sometimes about what an employee earns here at the city on an average. We hear a lot about employees that make over $100,000. You know, the classic example is when an you know, executive at the city retires or a chief retires at the city. The, I, we can always guarantee it. The very final line in the paper is gonna be how much they're gonna be making in, in, for their pension. And that's appropriate. What also, though, is never in the paper is what our average person is making in retirement. And that's what I'm showing here. So our average miscellaneous retiree is earning around $36,000, police around 66, fire around 77. So when you look at all the employees as a whole, there's many different careers within there. Some folks just stay around for a little bit. Some folks stay around for their entire career. But when we take a huge step backwards, that's what we look at at the plan. 
So like we talked about a moment ago, we have three different formulas for each group of employees on what their benefit is based on when they were hired. And just looking at those numbers from the top, you know, well, what's really the difference between 3% at 50 or 2.7 2 at 57? It, it seems very abstract. So what I try to do here is I try to put just a, a you know, the same employee receiving three different plans. What really does their pension benefit look like? And so the example I gave for public safety was an employee was hired at the age of 30. They did 25 years of service here at the city. Their final compensation was $100,000 and what that meant to them as a final pension benefit. So as you can see at the top, the 3% at 50, that employee earned $75,000 as a pension benefit. The new benefits, the PEPPER benefits would have earned them $62,500. So you can see that that benefit has been reduced. The second, second example is miscellaneous. And what you'll see here is slightly different example, same concept though, hired, employee hired at the age of 30, 30 years worth of service, $100,000 compensation at the end of their salary, at the end of their career. That, empl that, that classic employee earning 3% at 60, they had a $90,000 benefit. When we look at PEPRA, that's $54,000. And I think it's fair to say that that's a dramatic decrease um, in what the, what the pension benefit was for that, that employee. Next slide. The concept I brought up a moment ago about well, who, who pays for pensions, this is, this is the classic example, it's called the CalPERS dollar. And it shows for every dollar, like a dollar that CalPERS pays out, where did that dollar come from? So 32% of it came from employers, 12% came from the employees, and 56% came from investment earnings. And I think the thing to take away from this, that I take away from this is first of all, that's a really good deal for the city. And that we've located, we've been able to offer a benefit to our employees that 56% of it is coming from a funding source outside of normal city revenue. That's a lot. Additionally, 12% employees are paying for. So the city's paying 32 cents on the dollar for every dollar being paid out. That's good. Can I ask a question What's, on that though? Yeah. How have they done in the investments and have they gotten the 56 cents we'll on the return? So we'll get there, absolutely. So I have a slide in the future we're gonna talk about. The thing- It's on the slide. No, I said wait until he's done with the whole okay. reason. Let's hold our questions. So um, that's a great deal. But as we, as we just brought up, there, a lot goes into that to say whether or not that came to fruition. What I will say though, to, to your question, is that is based on actuals. So the dollars going out the door, that is the truth, uh, uh, the, the accurate statement at the moment. But the story is a lot more broad than that. Like we brought up, pensions are a broad subject. We can't look at any one thing and say that that's the full story. So let's go on to the next slide. So next slide is, is exactly what we wanted to talk about. That 56 cents sounds fantastic, a great deal, but it's based on risk and risk goes one of two ways. Risk can either be good or it can be bad. And has CalPERS been able to do what they said they were going to do? Meaning meet their expected return, meet their discount rate for a return. And that answer isn't quite as straightforward as you might think. At the very bottom, maybe is the first good thing to look at, and that's just the compounded annual rate of return. Now, we can look at that and say, well, over 20 years, CalPERS has earned 6.9%. That's a good thing when, again, we think about how CalPERS has created value for the city, how they've been able to create funding for the city for this employee benefit program. It is, they have clearly demonstrated that that's there. But what that's really measured, measured against when we look at how we're doing on a funding basis is, well, how close is that to what you said you were going to do, right? Because that matters. It doesn't just matter what you did. It matters what you say you were going to do versus what you did. And this is going to be a little hard to see, but there's a really important line on this graph I want to point out first. And that's the line that goes across the x-axis. It is a blue line and it starts if on the left-hand side right around seven and a half, seven and three quarters percent. You see that line that goes all the way across, it's blue. Mm -hmm. That's what CalPERS was supposed to be earning each year, each year along the way. That's their discount rate. That's their expected return. And so the way that we think about it in finance is really that's zero. 
So when CalPERS, when we look at the 2009 um, Great Recession year, where CalPERS lost 23.6% of the portfolio, it's really much worse than that. It's really 236 additionally minus the seven and a half they thought they were gonna get. They really lost 30%. So it, we, we judge them about what they say they're gonna get, how, how close they were to their plan. Now, if you look at the line, which is very hard to see on this small graph, so I'm sorry, you'll see that there's a dot along the way along that line going across. And that's each time that CalPERS has lowered its expect ex expected return. If we went back farther, you would see expected returns from CalPERS over eight. Right now we are at 6.8. So over time here, CalPERS has dramatically decreased what they expect to earn. Now that's on the surface, a good thing. Less return, less risk, that's good. But it's not that simple. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But in general, I think the other thing to take away from this graph is volatility. L look at how those numbers are just all over. And, and really, if we were to look at CalPERS returns from, I don't know, 1980 to you know, a similar period in different decades, it wouldn't, the volatility doesn't look like that. We've got Great Recession, and now we've got COVID that 21.3 at the end and then the 6.1, just volatility. And pension funds don't do great with volatility, which is gonna lead us to some more discussion points in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. So what's, what's been the big changes with pensions? And this is the story. I think this slide is more important than the prior one with, with returns. I think returns over a very long period of time, when you look at that slide, they mostly even out to what CalPERS probably thinks they're gonna get. Um, but this one really matters. And I'm gonna start with the bottom one first. So CalPERS board actions and meeting new accounting standards. So back around 2011, 2012, the same time I started with the city, um, a lot changed in, in pensions, big time. Um, First of all, they've, they've dramatically decreased, decreased that expected return rate. Again, a high around 8.5%, now it's 6.8%. When you impact your discount rate, this is a critical thing to understand. You impact it backwards. So everyone, all of your retirees, all of your employees that have been earning service credit, they've been earning the benefit, you thought that, that you were going to be getting 7.5%, and now you've moved it to 68 you've created a very, very large unfunded liability. When you change 1% for Santa Rosa backwards, you give us a $200 million liability. So the story with pensions is not just investment returns. That is part of the story, certainly. But a very large part of this story is changes to the pension system, meaning we don't think we're going to make as much as we used to. And now we've got a large liability from it. Um, another huge change with how it happened was CalPERS was originally, I, I will say, created by very smart actuaries and very smart finance people, maybe a little too smart. And that some of their ideas I think were pretty good, but they were very hard to explain. And one of the, one of the things that was very hard to explain was how they amortize their losses. So when CalPERS lost a bunch of money, they had this rolling average, very complex way of amortizing the loss and the city paying for that loss. And in practice, that rolling average really meant that it took about 50 years to pay off a loss. If we lost a dollar today, it was going to take the next 50 years for the city to pay off that, that dollar. Now, an actuary would take a little bit of issue with that statement, but I'll tell you it's true. That's how long it took. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense for... Uh, a generation to essentially push its losses onto the next one that way. And so they aggressively cut that from a 50 year rolling average loss schedule to a 30 year fixed, much like your house has a 30 year amortization schedule. And just like when you change the mortgage on your house and you go to a much shorter term, your payment goes up. 
by a lot, especially if you could imagine you had a 50 year mortgage and now you went to a 30 year mortgage, your payment just went way up. Again, it sounds great, but where the rubber hits the road is where the city needs to make payments. Another big component of why our payments are going way up. Recently, they doubled down on that methodology. And now when we lose a dollar, it takes 20 years to amortize it. So sometimes I explain this as the reform is still getting reform, reform. We're, we're, we are reforming ourselves a lot here within this system. Top, the top part, again, critical to understand. PEPRA. PEPRA, the former actions I just talked about, rear-facing. They're affecting things that have happened in the past. PEPRA affects things happening in the future. So a lot of times there's some confusion saying, I'm waiting for all this benefits of, of the PEPRA employees. They, they're costing us so much less. I should see all these benefits coming so quickly. It's not that way. Because they're forward-facing, really, the benefits of PEPRA are really the city sees 20 years from now. 50, you know, 30 years from now. We see some benefits, and we're going to talk about, about those a little bit more in a moment, but the critical thing to understand is PEPRA will not solve our unfunded liability problem we have now because that has happened in the past. PEPRA is affecting the future. Next slide. We talk about good news, right? This, this is good news, and the city we can be really proud and we are leaders in the pension area. And there's three really powerful examples here. First, starting in 2013, 14, I believe, um, employees came forward recognizing these increased uh, contributions were gonna be necessary to CalPERS and all bargaining units that are classic employees pay more than their required share. The, the amounts differ um, amongst groups, amongst benefit level. Uh, police classic pays as high as an extra five and a half percent of their paycheck towards their unfunded liability cost. Um, and that's good. Uh, in FY20, the city made an additional $4.2 million payment to CalPERS. Um, we paid more than what we had to to help future payments. We are still benefiting from that today um, in our benefits, in our in our in our budgets that we're putting together, we see a little benefit of that from each year. Um, that was a very good action. And then I, I personally, I think the biggest, or one, they're all big, uh, but in last year, we created a section 115 trust to prefund, prefund pensions. Um, GFOA sees this as a best practice for agencies like us. We feel very strongly about our strategy. We feel, um, really enthused with how it's gone so far. And we're gonna talk about that some more in a minute. Next slide. So as I'm gonna show here in the next slides, the pension expense for the general fund has gone much higher. It is, we're, so just take a look at the screen. You know, we're, we're talking about topping out at $42 million in fiscal year 31. Fiscal year 24, we're at 25. Um, I have a graph here in a moment that shows our, our history. These are really large numbers. And um, the actions that we're taking, I believe are gonna help mitigate some of this impact, not all. Um, this will continue to impact city operations. Um, there is no easy way out of this. Next slide. Okay, so this is the most important one. So hopefully, let me let me do my best here. Um, this is gonna this one's gonna come with a story. So I started with the city right at the beginning of this graph, and the very one of the first things I was given was pensions, and the reason for that is because all the new accounting uh, implementations came in, and they said, "New guy, congratulations on your new job. Here you go." And so, and Alan's laughing because he's the one that did it. Um, so back then, when I went through the exercise to look at it, I looked at all these changes that happened and, and all these major changes that happened. And I, and I put together a graph very similar to this. And I said, this is what's going to happen at the city. And we were going from a, you know, 
three and a half million dollar contribution from the general fund to a five million dollar general fund contribution. And and the reaction I got was that's not pot three to five million. That how 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 could we do that? How could that be? How could we go from three to three to five million dollars? This was management and 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 that was used to zero and negative. They were they weren't used to having to pay unfunded liability like this. How the questions were, how can we maintain city services if you're saying that we're going from three to five million dollars? We're gonna have to make cuts in our budget, we're gonna have to impact operations. And I was told, um, so again, I, I gave them a graph just like this, and it looked just like this, and it said, you know what, I 2031, this is where I think we'll be. And they said, and them and some other folks that have been around and, and experienced with Calper said, that's not the way it works out. What's going to happen is that sometimes CalPERS is up and sometimes CalPERS is down. We lost some money. They'll make it up. It's going to be okay. This isn't going to happen. And I, reje I re rejected that at the time, and I still do today. The other comment would be, well, that's great, but you're not really factoring in PEPRA. We're going to be saving so much money from our PEPRA employees that that's going to mitigate this graph, and we're not going to get there. And I reject that at the time, and I reject that today. And where we are today is where we are here on the graph. And as you can see, I call this Calpers Mountain, and we're halfway up. And I think we're going to reach the top of the mountain. I think I don't think that there is a tunnel. I don't think that there's a shortcut. I don't think there's anything that will come along and and stop that. Now, Alan and I would both tell you that during COVID, when Calpers had the 20 some odd percent return, we both sat and we were both flabbergasted and said, because it cut that graph. The graph I said wouldn't get cut, it did. And we were flabbergasted and we said, wow, the problem we said wouldn't go away, it kind of is going away a little bit. And that's great news. And we were, we were very happy, um, but we were realistic and said, well, let's see how it goes next year. And next year we had a horrific uh, return with CalPERS and the graph went right back to where it was. Again, I, I don't think that there's an easy answer to this problem. I don't think that there is a holistic answer to the problem. I think that come five years and six years and so on down the line, I think the graph's gonna look very similar. Now, what's important about that is though, is I also reject the idea that when folks say, hey, you know what, CalPERS just goes up every year, it's gonna go up every year forever. And that's that, that's not true eventually it's going to come down and it's going to come down because those major changes I talked about discount rate change, amortization change, the large losses from the great recession eventually start falling off this graph and things start going down. I don't believe that. I don't believe that we'll have a, a, a just consistent we'll be at 50 million forever or keep going up forever. I, I reject that. That's not going to happen. The problem is that, we're talking about 2033, 2034, 2035, 2036. How much solace does it give us today and our current needs today to say, hey, great news ever, you know, again, good news. Things are gonna be great in 2035, 2036, right? That's a very hard message to, to send, to, to give. Next slide. Here are those numbers summarized. Um, the city has a $490 million combined um, unfunded liability across all funds. We're about 69% funded. Fund ratio is a, is a good ratio to understand how well you're doing. Um, we need, we, they're trying to make the system so we are much higher, much more funded quickly. That is their goal. Next slide. So the section 115 trust, we've looked at a lot of big numbers. And as council uh, funded $10 million from general fund stability reserves and, and Santa Rosa water chipped in as well from their operating reserve into a 115 trust to help mitigate some future pension expenses. Um, council also did, which was critical during this period is they, re they identified a continuing funding source for the section 115 trust being our pension obligation bonds Simply put, we no longer have to pay them off starting in this next current budget cycle. And 
they identified in that what I call pension should feed pension. We shouldn't just let a pension expense fall off when we know we have higher pension expenses. We should retain that funding and put it towards our pension expenses versus kind of a quick boomerang effect of trying to recognize a saving that you're eventually that you're immediately just spending at the same time as well. Um, so they recognized, they said, hey, that, that pension obligation funding, let's direct that towards the 115 trust, earn interest on it, and use that to help mitigate some of our higher years. Um, the goal at that time was to have, we, when we worked with our consultant, we wanted to have clear measures on how much we wanted in this trust, how much we wanted in the reserve. And, and the kind of industry standard uh, for agencies is you want to have about one year's worth of payment at the time you set it up. For us, that was $26 million. So we have the 10. Our goal is to have it grow to that $26 million number. Um, we, are, we are pleased to say that in FY23, the net return on our pension obligation or on our 115 trust was 6.6%. That's good. It outperformed CalPERS. I will um, say that next year if I come back and it's not good. It's not, you know, it, over, we believe in that over time. We believe in compounding interest. We believe in the ability of, of, our, of our investment portfolio to grow. Um, we're happy that it came in good the first year, but again, we're not gonna view this on a year to year basis. We're gonna view this over time. Next slide. I think that's, you might wanna echo that point is that as we start getting into the trust, that's a, we're taking a very long view with this. So these aren't, these aren't quick wins. These are, I mean, we're happy to see good performance, but we are looking on a long view in order to uh, solve problems in the, in the future. Thank you. Um, since the time of setting up the 115 Trust, we had what we didn't want to happen and that CalPERS had a very bad fiscal year 21 of a negative 6.1 investment return. Um, when we set it up, we said, hey, our, our goal is to not touch it, but in the case where something like that were to happen, we wanted to be strategic and, and revisit that idea and come back and say, no, now our contributions have significantly increased. We need to have a usage plan of our 115 to help our operations. Um, we gave that proposed strategy to the long-term finance to the finance to, to this committee last year, um, which was supported. Um, and I plan to do the, we're gonna show that again here on the next slide. Um, but the general concept was, hey, we, we wanted to focus our usage around um, using the POB money versus the initial investment money. That $10 million, we, we kind of, we want that to sit. And we want that to grow over the time, exactly what Alan said. That is the long-term seeding. We want that to sit and grow over time to get us to where we want it to be. We can redirect the POB funding in the meantime to be used in the trust, but at the same time, direct it towards the peak of our years within our amortization schedule. That tip of the mountain, we want more of a mesa versus a mountain. Um, so go to the next slide, please. Here is that in numbers. So our proposal is that we begin a drawdown uh, from the section 115 trust beginning in FY25. And it, it carries on through FY32 through the peak of that mountain to try to mitigate some of those large increases at that time. Um, water has the same investment scenario or in the same usage scenario on here. Um, as you can see, I, I wish that our 115 trust could just mitigate our payment and take us from a $35 million payment to a $5 million payment. But what I would say is that in, as a finance person, I'm a very large believer in incremental difference and making better than it would be is very, very good. I, I love less. That's what I truly love as an accountant. I love to see bills go down but less than it would have been is still a very powerful thing for the organization. And that's what this strategy accomplishes um, while still maintaining our balance and maintaining our flexibility. What we really love about the 115 Trust is that it gives us flexibility. It gives us an opportunity to receive feedback from council on how we're using it, the right, right approach. But what we wanna stress is consistency and 
using and being mindful and, and purposeful on how we do so, um, which I believe we're doing. Next slide. So with that, I just covered an incredible amount of information. So um, what we'd really like to hear is comments, concerns, uh, support towards our strategy for the 115 trust that we've, we're, we're proposing to keep. Um, I'd like to address any questions towards pensions that you may have. Um, like I said in the beginning of the, of the presentation, my goal of the presentation is to be general or get into the weeds, but I know that there's a lot of technical information about pensions that I'd be happy to address if I can. So with that, I'll see any questions. All right, looking at committee members, I know you have. I have to leave in a few minutes. Do you mind? I know that part, but you have some questions. I there. do, do you want me to go, go first? first? Thank you. Okay, so um, you stated that we have a $200 million deficit that we have to be able to plug because of the CalPERS investment. So how do we eat the elephant? You know what? I know we've started on the 115 trust, but how do you actually ultimately yeah. remove your unfunded liability? Yeah, I great question. Some steps. Great question. Could you go to slide uh, 11, please? So that's what this slide is. This slide is the eating of the elephant. This slide is a hey, we're paying $20 million this year. We're going to pay $30 million next year. Remember, we're making our payments to CalPERS. Okay. to accomplish that goal, to eat away at that $500 million um, uh, elephant is a perfect way to put it. Eventual so so we, are, we are on, it's the same way you pay off a mortgage on your house. It's, it's every single month we're making that payment, we're on a schedule, and eventually that really large principal that you owe, you start paying it off piece by piece. What we've done, which is really powerful though, is we are taking additional bites. That that 115 trust strategy is us saying, we're not just going to follow CalPERS schedule. We are also going to make our own bites at this elephant additionally through this strategy. And, and the investment's going right back in to reinvest, right? So if we're getting 6.8, then that interest on that goes back in to help with the unfunded liability. You got it. You got okay, it. So that, that makes sense to me. Great. What's the state's responsibility to helping us fund CalPERS? And do they have any responsibility? Because this is similar to what they've dealt with in schools with STRS and FERS. They just put more on the employee in uh, you know, school districts and more on teachers. So it's the same principle here with CalPERS then? None. The, the state has no, no, respons responsibility. no responsibility for our unfunded liability. Okay. When that, that was really, I think... The stress test for that has been done when Stockton went bankrupt okay. and Stockton claimed that CalPERS was one of the main components of bankruptcy. CalPERS, you need to do something about this. And that obviously was taken and to courts. What's, what's and, CalPERS' responsibility for their investments that have gone bad? Is there any... I would, I would say again, none. None. We are, we are contracting out... It's a bad decision and that's that. Yep. Okay. That's good to know. And I think that's important for us to know too, that there's really not anything we can do to mitigate that. Um, how is the CalPERS board chosen? Um, well, there's different seats on the board. Uh, the state treasurer is one of them. Um, there's additional appointees like the uh, all employee, all state employees will basically vote. So there's a state employee representative. Uh, all employees within CalPERS has, oh, has a somewhere in law. It is, and so there, there's what I'm really saying is I, I could name off a few of the ways of the game. I can't name all of them. Um, I think that's where the state feels like they should be responsible when the state treasurer sits as overseer of the CalPERS board. So that's probably where some of my confusion has come in. Sure. Um, so. What is our total right now for our unfunded liability? I've heard eventually it's going to be a it's, half a half a billion. The, it's, it's the four ninety eight. It's the slide. It is that much right now today. Correct. We have a half a billion dollar Correct. unfunded liability. Correct. Yeah, I think it was four ninety eight. It's four eighty nine. Four eighty nine. Three three four. four round up. Yeah. So just in case. So that's okay. One of the things we've talked about a lot, Alan, is adding back services for things that we've contracted out. 
And that I can see has been a hesitation based on finance for these unfunded liabilities. From my perspective, the concern is that the contracts continue to go higher and higher and higher. So my concern consistently is we keep outsourcing contracts because there seems to be pushback on this unfunded liability. At what point can we say, we still need to take a look at these contracts because in the long run, we still are better off to actually deal with adding some employees back to services and how do we mitigate the unfunded liability component of being able to do that? Because I, I see things in the city that are also liabilities because we aren't bringing back services we're very reactive in our approach. And as a decision maker, that makes me uncomfortable. So um, thank you for that, by the way. That's, uh, and what we do is, uh, you know, we still analyze whether a service makes sense to come uh, to be done by city forces. Um, what, uh, what we're finding though, is that while contract costs will go up, uh, a, a contractor's cost could go up due to inflation or whatever, uh, uh, how, how they're doing their pricing, it, in the long run, we're still seeing that the cost of city, city services by city employees is, is higher. In, addition, there is a level of flexibility that a city has. And given what we're going through or will be going through with our budget, I think where we come from is, you know, we want to have the flexibility to be able to um, uh, uh, lower a cost through ending a contract versus lowering a cost through uh, um, laying off employees. And that's what we went through. You want to step in? No, go ahead. Oh, oh I mean, that's what we went through back in the recession. Right. And, and so, yes, having gone through that, I am very reluctant and skeptical that, that especially a service that we used to do in-house and have now contracted out, to bring that back in house and and reinstitute all those costs, I don't see how that works. That said, we do analyze these things objectively, and if it makes sense, we would we would propose that, or at least at least give that that um, we we would back that recommendation and so i want to clarify i want to clarify okay and i just on that though alan if say we are contracting for eight people but you said well council you can con you can hire in four people and that would be similar in cost that's the piece that i feel sometimes is missing for us like you can't you may not get the same service but you could bring back your own service but you're going to maybe get less because of unfunded liabilities that when you're doing your analytics on something that would be of interest to me because then it's back on council to say we still feel it's best to have our own employees do it even though we have fewer and we maybe not be able to go as far we still will have staff on hand to be able to do maybe other jobs not just what we're contracting for because in a contract it's very clear what they're responsible for right. but an employee sometimes you can send them and do several different things that we come across a lot, I think. So that, that would be of interest to me when it comes to unfunded liability. But it's, it's always back on council, though. Because at the end but of the day... But if we don't have the data to yeah, show Yeah, then us. we ask them. But at the end of the day, we're the decision makers. So they can suggest we go through a contract or do it that way. I think part of the thing and the frustration is we feel like we get contracts when it's detrimental to where we're going. Right. So we don't really have the time to say, oh, we want to explore hiring in right. instead of continuing with, no, it's last with, minute. with the contract. And so I think that is where some of the frustration, sorry for, but no, no it's that's true. where some of the frustration. Yeah. And we can't in. send it to you to say, well, wait a minute, we'd like to have this information on the unfunded liability because now we're 
we're, we are going to be out of contract in a week and a half. That Sorry, pisses uh, me off. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I want to really clarify something here. Cause I, I will say that I worked literally on that exact subject today. Okay. On, on an analysis of city employee versus contract employee. Okay. And when I did that, I removed any unfunded liability proportion mm -hmm. from payroll out of that. So when we look, when we do an analysis for in-house versus out-of-house employee, unfunded liability is not part of that equation. Their CalPERS retirement percentage is, but not unfunded because unfunded is a set amount we are going to pay every year. It is a fixed amount. Whether we had one employee or a million employees, mm. we are following that graph. If we have one or a million. So it wouldn't it matter a, actually on the- It does not matter. And so when finance people. gets asked, hey, we are doing an analysis on in-house labor. We need to know our, exactly how much a facilities attendant costs. Okay. Our budget analyst goes through, they pull the, the position budgeting amount and they subtract out the unfunded a liability amount. Now, let's understand though, that's just one benefit line item in an employee's budgeting. They're still budgeting for retirement. They're still in a retirement. They're still health care. So I, I just want to set that to rest that unfunded liability is should not be a factor and it is not when we do our analysis on in-house versus out-house there and, I, and I, I can say literally i worked on that today okay and the retirement amount just so i'm clear isn't through calpers that we set the amount that the employees are coming in at is that's part of a negotiation the amount that the employees pay towards their pension is a part of the negotiations within their mou with that bargaining unit versus yes. for classic employees, for PEPRA employees, for the new employees, there is a set formula and that's, where they pay half. That's the part that you do when you're doing your uh, projections and analysis. Okay. Got it. That's very helpful to separate those two out for decision making. And I really apologize. This is the kind of stuff I actually love to learn from all of you. So thank you for the um, presentation today. I have another meeting at five o'clock, but this will be my last one I miss. So thank you so much. And um, thank you for answering my questions for, for all that you guys are doing. So thank you, Mayor, for allowing me the chance to have those questions answered. Sure. Um, Scott, this was a really impressive, this is one of the more impressive presentations I've sat through. I think you went through that, this kind of like nuanced information and make it as clear as you did for basically a, for a lay audience. Um, that was, that's impressive. Thank you. Because um, some of the stuff, some of the stuff I'm at least vaguely familiar with, but you're you're making me think about some of the things in new ways, like like the accounting standards in terms of um, when Calpers does change its expected return rates. I hadn't really thought through what that meant for looking back into the past and then and then having that affect the, the future unfunded liabilities. All right. So as I as I'm processing some of this, let me start off with some some easy ones just to just to warm up. Um, so our, our unfunded, our what, 68, 69% unfunded rate. When I sat through the CalPERS presentation in Sacramento a few, um, a couple of months ago, I guess, it looked like, it looked like that was somewhere in the middle of the, of the cities in the state. Or is that accurate? Like we're not the only ones that are in that range. No, I think what, what really matters if I look at different agencies on how funded they are versus, versus not, the thing I look at is how much has that city grown? Cities that... You know, cities that have experienced a huge amount of growth recently, they don't have as many retirees where the CalPERS liability has been built up, built up, built up. Yeah. You know, like cities like we can think of some that have had a lot of growth over the past 15 years. Yeah. In Roseville, those kind, kinds of agencies, they have a much higher funded status. Also, I will say that some agencies down south that have had a more proactive approach towards funding their unfunded liabilities, they have a higher percentage. I think the classic question is 69%, is that good or bad? I don't know. I, I think what really matters is this chart. I, I think it. I think yeah. that's what matters. I think your payments is what matters. We can't, I don't think any agency should look at themselves and go, we're good, 69%, or we're bad, 69%. It's really is, how is your agency going to pay for that? How are they going, what is your agency's plan to address that chart? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, I mean, that's a good, that's a good, perspective and I wasn't putting a value judgment on the on the percentage so much as just 
putting it in context. We're not, yeah. the, only, we're not the only city that's no. dealing with that no. right now. This is an ocean rising tide, lowering tide. Yeah, it was interesting no. how, how recently it was that, more, that most of the state was in that you know, 80, 90% funded rate. And then as you pointed out, the recent return years have, have pushed everyone down. And recent return years plus the actuarial changes have pushed everyone down. Yep. Um, so let's actually talk. I don't want to get too, too much into the, into the weeds, but with, with that's where I live, so it's okay. <laughs> How much into the actual actuarial tables do you want to get? CalPERS had a slide, and so it was Jason Not and I sitting in there, and they had they basically had the CalPERS wide version of this chart, yeah. and they were again they were showing the they were showing the change basically the pre COVID post COVID change in the, yeah. in the actuarial change in the actual actuarial tables where they had their version of the mountain, and then because of well. They didn't get into the reasons, however macabre they might have been. But basically, in the last few years, the mountain or the mountain for for Calpers has turned into more of a mesa, and the decline starts earlier than they expected a few years ago. Does our chart take into account any recent actuarial changes? This this chart is the most recent, most updated information possible. Okay, so this, this is, is coming straight from Calpers too. They're giving us these numbers. This is coming straight from oh, Calpers. God. And tomorrow, how I, I spoke with our actuary this week. This is this is as updated as it can get. And I, I will I will kind of toot the fi- toot finances horn, um, not just me but our staff. In that this information is more updated than the one in our actuary. So is Cal- so when Calpers is is um, telling us what we're going to owe them, is that based on that's that's not based on our specific retired employee data. It absolutely is. When, when you look at a general CalPERS presentation, they're looking yeah. at all agencies. Correct. Across the board that may have di- very different, yeah. maybe a fire district, might be, could be anything. This, all the data that I presented today is specifically for us. It's based off of our retirees. It's based off of our employees. It is. So they're looking at our, our universe of 1,300 retirees or whatever it is, their, their ages, their, their yeah. expected lifespans, et cetera. And they're saying, okay, this is what you got to pay us this year. Yeah. Okay, that, that was the question I had. I wasn't sure where that, where that number It is that granular. From. Absolutely. Okay, so this would have been taken into account their changes. That's, that's really interesting. Yes. Okay. Um, hold on. I think those are, those and, are the- and, and when you talk about, I, I would bet you when you saw Calper's presentation that presented that Mesa concept, yeah, they had not factored in the six point nine six point one percent loss in fiscal year twenty two. Oh, I, I bet you. I like that. I like it. I like if you figured out an error in their presentation in absentia. That would be impressive. And it's not an error. It's the most updated information they have. So we're going past that. Um. All right, good. That, that's helpful. All right, another, an easy one here because I'm sure there's some sort of easy explanation. Just the, the jump up and then the decline to the very end of that graph. What's that coming from? Yeah, that's exactly what I talked to our actuary about. Um, so what that what that's what that came from is that we had this amazing year of returns of the 20 percent, whatever it was, in fiscal year 21. Right, mm-hmm. great year. That first amazing year of returns, and then we had the horrible year after that. Mm-hmm. That really resents that that one year represents that all the other years prior to that had that awesome credit from that great year of returns. Okay. And that year doesn't. That that it falls off. That credit, big old credit falls off in fiscal year 43, but the big hit from the law still remains for the year after that. Oh I, God. what I'd really say is I, I double checked to make sure it was right and it's right. Um, but that'll I'm assuming that'll smooth out over time. It will. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. Once we start stacking more amortization bases off of it, I think that'll normalize. It'll it'll come down, and, and the graph will make more sense. Okay. Um, all right. I think my final question. Um, this is a pretty easy one. So you had. I like the. I like the chart you had on slide fifteen, where you talk, where you show. And I like the metaphor too of the mesa rather than the mountain. That's a really helpful way to think about it. Um, in terms of the in terms of the amount that's in the section one fifteen trust. So for pulling out. The 1.8 to 3 to whatever the amount is over those years. How, what is the level of what, what, what's happening to the level of the actual 115 trust? So great question. Thank you for that. The intent of that strategy is to have our balance within the 115 trust be the initial investment of $10 million plus or minus investment returns over that entire time and leave that pure and untouched. So the, the cor- amounts- corpus in the endowment terms, the corpus stays untouched and we're just, we're living off the proceeds. We're yeah. pulling down the proceeds every we're, year. We're going to let the council initial investment grow over compounding interest over time. Okay. And use the POP funding 
in its place. So we, so we would anticipate with this plan that in, in, the, in 20, 30, whatever, we're, we're still have, we still have that, that 14, that's the goal. We still have it plus interest. Interesting. We, and we still have the long-term aspiration of growing into 26. Absolutely. But we'll, we'll live with, with whatever the less Absolutely. amount is if it helps us lower. And, and it gives us, if we're going to retain through this strategy, the ability that if fiscal year 2031 comes around and, you know, forbid something bad, you know, something bad happens within the markets, we still have that funding to use at our discretion to say, hey, guess what? Something else happened. Well, I mean, no one's gonna be surprised at this point. Something is happening constantly, right? So something else happened. You know, hopefully not a pandemic again, hopefully not a great recession, but something else happened. We still have our nest egg to still go back and say, wow, something really that we couldn't have anticipated happened. We still have that as a resource to help mitigate yeah. something that may happen additionally. Okay, I'll stop there. Again, really, really good and helpful presentation. Thank you for thank you for doing this. How many how many times have you done this, by the way? Uh, a handful, handful. Yeah, over the years, a bunch. Just like Al Gore's climate change PowerPoint, where it's been updated every year for twenty years. Unfortunately, it's a good one. Thank you for doing it. So I'm happy that council members can get in the weeds because I'm kind of lost in the middle of the street. So I'm going to ask you a question. Please. Um. So when we talk about the unfunded liability. And I'm getting the point that it cannot be reversed, right? It's a set number. Each year it changes. Yep. But 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 think about it as in what you've already racked up. It's it's like a credit card. It's, it's like the debt you've already acquired is yours. Is yours. You got it. But we can um, acquire more debt because we have an endless limit on this credit card. Yes, we certainly can. So if CalPERS were to, this is, these are great questions, by the way. If CalPERS was to have really bad years going forward, yes, we're, we're, that credit card balance is still going to grow. It's not, it, we, we still are subject to it growing. Now, the pension reformers would say, well, the great news about that is it's going to grow less than it would have because of the benefits not as being as generous as they were before. And because you now think you're only going to earn 6.8% versus the seven and a half. So we've, they have taken actions to make that future credit card debt way less than it was before, if that makes sense. So that's a positive. Um, so then I want to get back to something vice mayor said, um, so if we continue to hire in-house and not contracted workers, if it does continue to grow, the number of employees then affects what we keep putting on the credit card. I, I think that's where yes. it was confusing is that it's yeah. not what we already have, but the more employees we have, it still may impact our unfunded liability if we go back into adding to the credit card. I completely agree. Okay, so I think very, that's very the good point. The very confusing good point. part, and when people say unfunded liability, it's really it's the potential yeah. that it can add to absolutely um, our credit card. I, I think that's a very wise point. Absolutely, yeah. like having a baby, you can't even afford the ones you got. Okay, never mind. <laughs> that's a good I, metaphor. Too. I, I always have to have a metaphor because that's how I remember. I, I think thinking of it that way is very astute in saying, and saying, and those are the ex that's exactly what Alan was was speaking to. And that it is, it is not just a, a one-off, it is a holistic view on, on how we manage our workforce in the proper level. Um, well, I know you have another one, but I too would like to thank you because this is uh, very difficult to understand um, because there's a lot of different nuances and things when you have to talk about this. Um, but I did want to, I had one more uh, question and it's, it would be historically, it would be historically why the city didn't choose to do something. When I worked at the county, we actually, why you look like that? Uh, this is a great question. <laughs> How do you know my question? No, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Please, Mary, go ahead. You probably do know my question, but we actually had money, um, PEPRA employees had to give money for unfunded liability that we didn't even accrue, that we would never ever see, but we were giving money to the unfunded liability. Why is it that 
the and I don't agree with that because some of my check went to that and I don't think it should have. But why is it that the city and this I guess this is a historical question about a decision that was made. Why didn't we put it on the employees to pay for the unfunded liability? Because the county sure did. So we absolutely did. So employees are paying. This is one when I talked about. So during that same period with the county, the city had a completely similar action. Employees now at the city, the classic employees that that this mm -hmm. unfunded liability really came from, they are paying more than what they have to. They are paying an additional, like I said, police sworn pays an additional five and a half percent of their paycheck towards the reason of unfunded liability to help to help with that. Now, what the city did um, is that the city didn't direct that five and a half percent towards a pension fund or towards it, it is just a credit against operations. So the city is still, to be fair, today it's still the same impact. It's still a credit against a charge. It still works out in that favor, but they didn't direct it towards, let's say, a 115 trust, et cetera. It, the employees are making additional contributions towards unfunded liability. That is absolutely true here. Interesting. They left that, they left those funds general fund. They didn't restrict them. Yes. Okay. Just for, just for just wrong for, answers. Just for, no, just for reasons <laughs> of great question. Just for reasons of flexibility. I won't speak to what I yeah, I don't know. I, I won't speak to that. I wasn't, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting you to shrug. Now I'm more curious. <laughs> well, no, it's not. I, I mean, I can't get into the mind of, of the policymakers. Yeah. Point. Okay. What I would say is that we've done everything to try to to try to be more forward looking and to uh, um, you know, uh, uh, provide the mitigation as well as we could, as well as we can now. So forgetting about whatever happened in the past, it's important to note that going forward, we're trying to rectify some things, I guess. That was, a, that was an impeccably diplomatic answer. That's, that, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm okay. waiting for the text. <laughs> Again, love it. Love it. Thank you for being real yeah. with us because I, I think that it, you know, we should be able to answer these questions. Uh, employees should be able to know and community members should be able to know how it works because there's a lot of misconceptions about unfunded liability and retirement and things like that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, normally we would take public comment, but seeing that there are no members of the public that are currently at this meeting, we will forgo public comment and we will now go to item 4.2 PEMHCA section 115 trust. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Chair Rogers. Um, this this will fall right into line of 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 taking the right actions and, and we're really excited about this item a lot um so next slide we're going to talk about what pemca means we're going to talk about the unfunded liability the city has for it some history city actions um what we're going to propose is an additional section 115 trust to address this problem um, we're going to talk about the next steps and then open it up for discussion. Next slide. So PEMCA, um, what this is really about is that the city offers retiree health to public safety employees, the are sworn employees. Um, after they retire, because the city contracts with CalPERS for our health care, they are, um, the PEMCA is the law that says that we need to offer those employees post-retirement health. And, um, I, I cite the government code and, and, and all that. Next slide. So there's some problems with this construct of being able to offer employees retirement at health through CalPERS. And the big problem is, is what we call pay as you go. Meaning that the city gets an invoice from CalPERS each month for the premiums of their retired employees and we pay it. But that's not really how it should work. It should work more like a pension plan, meaning that while you're an employee, the city should be setting aside a certain portion of your paycheck to help pay for your health care when you're retired. 
The city should be paying for your retiree health while you're a current employee, the same way we are trying to accomplish with pensions. There was no way to do that. CalPERS on a health basis side, they can't take your money. They wouldn't, they weren't able to take our money in advance. And so what happened was because of this, a really large unfunded liability happens. We've got all these expenses that have been accrued through employees, but we've got no money to pay for it um, really simply. So as of, if we look at the city's financial statement, as of 2023, that liability is almost $25 million. So not, not, not a small amount at all and, and, and a very impactful amount. Next slide. So the city recognized this as a huge problem in 2011. And what we decided to do at that time was we had nowhere to put the money, but what we said was, hey, we know we have this growing liability. We're gonna start budgeting for it and we're gonna start saving for it to offset the liability. We're gonna build up cash in an internal service fund to help pay for it. And so every single year from then, as part of our budget process, as part of employee benefits, we are recognizing that, hey, the current employees have a, safety employees have a retirement health benefit cost associated with them. Here's the amount and it's gonna to go to that fund. As of 2023, the balance in that fund is about $11 million. So we've got about $24 million worth, $25 million worth of liability, and we've got $11 million worth of cash. That's not enough. We, we still have a huge gap there to fill. And the problem is that the way we're doing it, it, that money sits within the city's general treasury and the investment returns in our general treasury, as we all know, are not very high. So unlike CalPERS, where we're re receiving a higher, or unlike our, our, our 115 trust for pension, where we receive that higher benefit of investment returns, our PEMCA money just sits within the city's books, earns very little interest, um, and it doesn't keep pace with what our PEMCA liability is. Um, the other issue is that the by having the money on our books, it can't be included in the actuary reports um, because the actuary see that money as in like, you're not really going to use it for this. Y'all are going to use it for something different. Mm -hmm. So that really is a struggle for us. And also our current strategy really provides no guidance on, on how we're going to use it. We're just essentially, we've got $25 million worth of liability. We're just throwing money at a problem and we're trying to offset it. And, and we're just not keeping up. The more money we throw, we're just not getting there. Next slide. So what we're proposing to do is to create a section 115 trust, just like the one we were talking about with pension. It would take the balance within that, that OPEB fund, that, that $11 million, and it would, it would fund, it would, it would move right into the 115 trust. And that's going to do a lot of really good things for us. Um, we're going to be able to invest it more broadly than we do the city's treasury fund, which in turn would give us higher returns. Um, the funds can be used in that actuary report. And once it gets into an actuary report, at that point, we can have a really productive and meaningful strategy built off of that to, with our actuaries to say, how are we doing on a funding basis? When do we need to start paying this down? How do we do that? And the payments would come straight from the 115 trust. So instead of us paying CalPERS, our 115 trust would pay CalPERS and we would fund our 115 trust. It is more of a, instead of a one-to-one -one payment relationship, it is a triangle with the 115 trust being in the middle, which flows through it, which is gonna make our resource planning a lot, a lot better. Um, I will always give the final bullet. And when I talk about investment returns, this comes with risk. Next slide. So if what we're, what we're looking for today is, is, is some guidance from the subcommittee to say that yes or no, we're interested in this and to move forward. If the committee were to give us the support for this item, it would follow the 115 trust and, and how this worked out with council and that um, we've already appointed a trustee through our pension 115 trust. Um, we would be retaining that trust administrator. We would not be going out and getting a brand new contract for this. It very much falls in line with what we're already doing. Um, finance would essentially bring an item to council approving the deposit of the money, we would bring that item to council and, and give a full explanation of this is what we're doing, this is how we're looking to do it. Via, uh, and then we would bring an investment policy to statement as well, like we did with the 115 trust to say, this is our plan for investment of these funds. Next slide. So it's a 
broad subject again, and I did go through it very quickly, but just in summary, we've got a $25 million liability that we've got $11 million for that following our previous discussion we just had. We want to improve our process. We want to do this better. And we strongly feel that a Section 115 trust will accomplish that. And, and I will also say that I feel that once we get an actuary study back from after this action, I think we may even see an immediate um, reduction to operating and for this expense line item citywide. I think once we get that money in there and invested, I, I think we're gonna see significant savings very quickly. All right. So um, I think the question was it, uh, on the last one, is CalPERS responsible for if they lose the money? Great question. Are you responsible if we lose? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Um, <laughs> so who believe me, if doing the actual, it'll be the person we contract or the agency that we contract with? No. So we, we PFM, um, they, are, they are our contracted out investment uh, folks for our 115 trust. They manage our money for us through this process. We pay them to do that. So this would be the same thing. We are, we are contracting out with PFM to manage our investments. Un we really like 115 trusts, unlike CalPERS in a way, because we have more authority over those funds. At any point, we could change our methodology and how we invest. We could become very conservative. We could become very aggressive within our policy. I will say that we would most likely be following our same guidance with the pension fund to say, we don't want to be too aggressive. We don't want to be too passive in our, in our management. Um, so I, I'm in favor of bringing it to the council um, because we, I mean, we have to take risks in order to get somewhere. We can't just continue to sit where we're at and hope for the best because that hasn't gotten us very far. Um, but I, I just want the risk to be very clearly um, pointed out because I, to me, the gains outweigh, but everybody might not see it like that, but I want the council to be as informed as they can. So Agreed. scenarios about, well, what happens if this, or what happens if, if this, um, just so we can put it in perspective, not only for us, but so the public can understand also um, what it is that we're looking at. Agreed. The, the presentation of council would be a full, uh, full throated discussion along those lines with PFM present to talk about our strategy, to talk about its development. And really from this point forward, if we get the go ahead today, that is when we go to work developing that process along with our consultant to, to, to nail exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. Council member Seth. Yeah, it's a no brainer. Um, and we really had, uh, you know, up to $11 million. Well, it wasn't 11 million at the start. We've had millions just sitting in an account earning essentially nothing. Correct. Oh. Um, and I will say that this hasn't always been an option. So, 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 so it, it's been an option the last few years. Alan and I would both say, you know, we I can't fall. It falls in the same conversation we just had. We are, when did the, we are, we are trying to address these issues quickly. When did the, when did the 115s first start popping up? 20. Maybe wrong. I, I don't want to say. Yeah. I, I it, wouldn't say it's fairly. They're they're fairly new, but um, I can't remember the exact date. We started looking at it at at the city. I think the first time we looked at it, the first time we actually did a presentation to this board was uh, right around two thousand, probably two thousand fifteen. Um, so that's going back a few CFOs, but that particular one was was a big fan of them. We started going in that direction. Then I think the fires happened and we she left the city. We redirected. The next CFO wasn't a big fan of them. So why not just to keep it sitting there earning nothing? Well, and that was that was well, I guess we were talking. Were we even talking about PEMCA back then? I think we're, we're I, I, I would I would share your sentiment and I would say that uh, as our guidance, you know, has been that we we are focused on getting.
back to yeah. focusing after the fire as we, we the city's been through a lot our focus now is really getting back to business you know and this is an example of that well again a no-brainer and just one, one final question for me so with this this 115 truck across, would I, am I intuiting correctly that it would have to be a bit more liquid than yeah. a pension? Because you will be taking, yeah. I mean, you will actually be pulling cash out on yeah. an annual basis. Correct. Correct. Okay. And that'll be part of the investment. When we develop the, the investment policy, yeah. those are all the things that we look at and, and consider and, and, and absolutely. Absolutely. Gotcha, man. We have this in the money market, government money market account earning 5% right now. All of those types of, can you, this is why we pay folks that you know. Yeah. Okay. Understand these things, so, right. so that no one comes back looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> count, count, count me in. Oh gosh! All right. So it looks like you have two thumbs up for this, right. and but this is normally a time when we were have public comment. We currently do not have any members of the public that are present, so we will forego our public comment for right now. Um, and again, you have two thumbs up to continue and bring it to council. Um, sorry, a bug. Um, so now we'll go to item 4.3, update on future ballot measures. Sure, this is just a, a quick update on where we are. Um, uh, we've been working on the opinion survey questions. Um, uh, we think we have those those ready and, and they are, uh, the, the polling company is is uh, programming that into their database, so they should be going out with that survey uh, um, toward the end of this month. Um, they'll be asking uh, just the general uh, questions that you would find in the city, but the ballot test questions will revolve around um, uh, uh, Increase in TOT, um, a uh, and then modernization of UUT, our UUT ordinance, and modernization of business tax. Okay. So those will go out. We are still refining our revenue estimates on the business tax part. Um, the other ones would be. Uh, TOT increase of 2% would be around $1.2 million estimated additional revenue to the general fund. UUT modernization, which would include uh, mobile devices, would be probably around uh, a million to a million and a half of your extra revenue that would come in. Um, uh, there, like I said, we're still working on the um, the number on business tax. So two and so two and a half million annually from those two, approximately, plus then whatever a million from the business. Yeah, tax and this is like just that. the initial survey that would come out, yeah. and we would take those results and try to figure out what our next step forward is okay. at the upcoming ballot cycle and ones beyond that. Okay. So, just right. still very preliminary stages, but we're we're about ready to end of this month, beginning of next month, we'll we'll have uh, community feedback at least to see where we're at. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Um so again, at this time is when we would go to the public to have public comment, but there are no members of the public that are present. So they should have been here today. This is a good topic. Should have had to mark into this more. Um, so uh, we will now go to item five, future agenda items. Next regular meeting would be, I, I don't have anything for that other than just the standard update on where we are with the- What? with the revenue measures. What is the date? It is- uh, December 13th, let me double check. Yeah. That sounds about right. December 14th. Okay. 14th sounds even more right. All right. So uh, being as though we do not have anything currently um, ready for that agenda, we will go ahead and cancel that meeting. Happy holidays. 
Bashaw Gibb. There you go. Um, <laughs> January, we'll do our mid-year uh, general fund budget update. Perfect. So December 14th will be canceled for the record. In January, we will be back with yes. the, the update. Yep. Are there awesome. any anything else you'd no. like to add before we adjourn? No. All right. Seeing nothing else, thank you very much for the presentations, and we will now adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.